Welcome. Today I thought we'd talk about the entity component system pattern and the journey I took to build mine. We use the term entity to represent a thing in the game world. This is similar to the concept of a game object, which you may have seen when working with other game engines. Just like a struct, an entity has a set of fields which defines the data it can hold. The main difference is that an entity can have fields dynamically added or removed. You might think of an entity as just a map that holds an arbitrary number of anything. However, for performance reasons that we'll see later, a lot of developers typically say that an entity is just an ID that can be used to read and write the entity's fields directly. Personally, I think this is a confusing distinction, so I'll call the entity's ID the ID, and I'll call the entity's collection of fields the entity. We use the term component to refer to a piece of data that we write to a field of an entity. For games, we might make things like position, velocity, and size into components. Usually, ECS frameworks use the type to differentiate two components. Here, position and velocity are considered different types, even though they are both just type defs for a VEC2. Notably, any piece of data becomes a component as soon as you write it to an entity. Entities will be pretty lonely all by themselves. Luckily, we usually have more than one. The collection of all entities is often called the world, which is a fitting name considering everything in the world belongs here. The abstract visualization for this is a table, much like a database, with the entity ID as the key and each column as an independent component. To extract a single entity is to read a row, and to add a new column is to create a new component. As you probably noticed, not all the rows have all the columns. ID number 1 is missing a size, and ID number 2 a position. Missing components is a supported case, some clay pots might not break, and some dragons might not breathe fire. We have a world filled with entities, but nothing is changing. Enter stage left, systems. Systems are simply functions that operate on the world. They might execute physics simulations, read player input, or even send messages over a network. Systems share data by sharing all of the entities in the world. For example, in the read input system, we read the player's input and write that to the world. Next, calculate velocity runs and determines the velocity of each entity based on its input. After that, the physics simulation will run and calculate a new position based on the previous position and velocity. Finally, the render sprite system runs taking the current position and current sprite and drawing that to the screen. With the systems laid out like so, you can see it's a directed acyclic graph, also known as a DAG, where earlier systems like read input and calculate velocity are required to finish before physics simulation can run. Thinking about our systems like this turns a disparate list of functions into something that is ordered and schedulable. The first iteration of the ECS library that I wrote relied heavily on hash maps. This doesn't necessarily mean it's slow, but trust me, it's slow. Let's look at the general layout because despite this complicated looking diagram, it's actually pretty simple. You can think of the world as a tree of component types, with each branch holding a subtree of entity component pairs. The code to build this data structure is actually pretty simple. Component store lets us look up the component for an entity. World lets us look up the component store for a component type. In my case, I use the reflected name of the component type as the key to the world hash map. Once we have a world, it's pretty easy to read and write components, like you see below. The most useful feature of our world is iteration. After all, we need to be able to write systems which can play well with our world. Here's what a small physics sim might look like. We read the position and velocity component stores at the top. I call them P and V, respectively. Next, we loop over all the entities that have a position, read their velocities, but skip them if their velocity doesn't exist. Finally, we can calculate the new position and write it back to the current entity's position slot. We need to do a bit of type assertions because the value returned by each component store is unknown. We can see that there is one hash map read and one hash map write per iteration of the loop. This isn't terrible, but for such a critical code path, it isn't ideal. The more silent problem, however, is cache coherency. When a byte of memory is read, the CPU caches a small segment of neighboring memory in what is called the cache line. So to fully utilize the CPU's cache, we want the next iteration of our loop to access the next bytes of memory. Because our component store was built to hold the any type, and because it's a hash map, the reads will be scattered all over memory. Every arrow that you see in the left diagram is a pointer that we must traverse to get to our component data. If we organize our data like the arrays shown on the right, then we can improve our cache coherency quite a lot. Now that we've seen how to make a slow ECS, let's make a fast one. As a brief aside, I very literally waited for generics to come out before I rewrote my ECS. We aren't going to get the performance we want with interface pointers and type assertions. Let me also take a quick moment and give a nod to some useful authors that helped me learn about building ECS frameworks. If you want an in-depth look on how more complicated ECS frameworks are built, I highly recommend these. I'll leave links in the description below. At first glance, it feels like we've already solved all our performance problems. Just pack it into arrays. Unfortunately, it's a bit harder than that. Suppose we made an array for every component and we pack all the entities into one big table. But not every entity has every component. This means that every time an entity is missing a component, we will have a gap in our table. Depending on how sparsely our components are used, we might end up with a fairly fragile 
fragmented array. Additionally, every time we create an entity, we need to allocate an extra column for every single component array. This could potentially waste a lot of memory. Imagine a system which checks every entity's health to make sure that the entity is still alive. This is a simple loop iterating over just the health array. Suppose we have a million entities, but only a thousand with the health component. When we iterate, we have to loop a million times just to operate on a thousand entities. A dramatic example, but because there's no easy way to filter entities by which components they have, we simply have to check every single one. We really just have two requirements. In a loop, we want to loop over only the entities that have the components we need. When accessed, we want to minimize the fragmentation of reads and writes. Turns out that organizing our arrays as archetypes can help with both of these. Instead of storing the world in one big table that holds every entity, let's create a bunch of tables, each tailored to hold a specific entity type. In our case, we might have a table for entities that only have a position component. We might also have a table for entities with a position, velocity, and size components. We can lazily create these tables as soon as we need them, else we run into a combinatorial explosion of creating a new table for each theoretical component combination, even though that combination isn't useful as an entity type. This new data organization removes a lot of waste caused from missing components by simply sidestepping the problem. Because every entity in a table must have all of the components, there can't be any gaps. Now that we've split entities into different tables, there is additional fragmentation when we have to loop over multiple tables. For example, if we want to loop over everything with a position and a velocity components, we now need to loop over both of these tables. On the other hand, we know that every entity in the two tables will contain the necessary components. Looping is easy as we don't need to check each entity to see if it has the components we expected. In this multi-tabled view of the world, we now need a way to find all of the tables which have the entities we want. If you imagine each table as a node in a graph with edges connecting tables that only differ by one component, you'll get something like this. It's possible to implement graph searches to filter the tables as needed, but graphs are hard to code and inserting new archetypes potentially requires adding several new edges between nodes. I chose instead to simply track the set of archetypes that a particular component is a part of. To filter, we want to use our component list to find the archetype sets that we're interested in, and all we have to do is take the intersection of those archetype sets. This gives us a final set of archetypes where each archetype contains all of the requested components. We have a lot of our puzzle filled in, but there's still a few more topics to discuss. How are we going to make this archetype table data structure which can hold a variable number of different components? After all, we don't want to handwrite every single kind of archetype like this. Luckily, this is the exact problem that an ECS solves, and we already built a slow ECS, so let's just use that. We can also throw in generics for some added type safety and performance gains. Here it's okay to use slower ECS methods. Most of our time is spent looping over individual entities inside of an archetype, not looking up the archetype. One last challenge is the addition and removal of an entity's components. Before we introduced multiple archetype tables, it would have been pretty easy to just add or delete individual fields on an entity. But now that we have different tables for each archetype, whenever we add or remove components on an entity, we are actually turning the entity into a different kind of archetype. This means that we need to move the entity from one table to another, copying all of the old components over one at a time and adding the newly added components on top of that. There are other implementations of entity component systems which don't have this downside, but I won't cover those here. For now, if you're using an archetype-based ECS, you'll want to add and remove components in batches and as infrequently as possible. I hope you enjoyed this introduction to how I implemented my ECS in Go. My next video will cover some benchmarks on this implementation to see how well it performs. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments, and I'll see you next time.